We can have the, the house music down. Okay, we're going to get started. Sorry for the delay. Um, you all probably have heard by now that uh, that people got lost. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, jump in anytime you want, Professor Cito. All right. The crowd roars. But first, um, I want to. Uh, <laughs> first, I want to wave at Patrick. Hello. To our viewing audience around the world. <laughs> um, Mike Libinati, we, we were wondering if one of the volunteers could stay out there and wait for Carol. Just one. Oh, good. Oh, she's here. Okay. Oh, excellent. Yay. Okay. 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 And well, she'll be joining us up here when she gets okay. here. Space for Should her. we get, just give it a couple more minutes? Just just riff a little bit? Or that's, well, that's I thought we, we've we been riffing for oh, yeah? okay. a long time. It's 1130. Oh. So. Right. <laughs> um, so first of all, just a little disclaimer. Um, so we are going to be discussing politics and we're going to be discussing um, um, heated issues. Um, but remember, this is being live streamed and recorded and archived. All right. So uh, the opinions of the panelists and the moderators and anybody that gets on mic are not a reflection of the Animation Educators Forum. Right. Brother says on their DVDs to not talk about this stuff would pretend that it's not would would seem that we are pretending that it's not there. Do you have anything to say about that? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, just to say welcome to everybody. And uh, this is the um, meeting of the uh, Animation Ed Educators Forum. Um, the idea originally started about a decade ago where um, uh, we just noticed that there's a number of animation faculty um, throughout Southern California and throughout the country. I mean, uh, you know, about a generation, you know, 50, 60 years ago, there was there was very little animation education. There was like a little bit of Cal Arts and a little bit of NYU, you know, and a little bit of Sheridan. And uh, the programs really kind of got going in the 70s. And um, the current day and age, just so many people in the field of, edu of animation education, but there's very little communication between the faculty. You know, everybody's sort of like working in their own like little zones, you know. And uh, so we thought it might be interesting to provide a nonprofit forum for people who are who, edu who are interested in, in animation education to get together and compare notes and to talk to one another and all. And once in a while, we, you know, uh, uh, try to pick a specific topic. And like Lee mentioned, um, this topic here, we're discussing, uh, you know, the, the current issues about um, politics in the classroom, you know. Um, just to uh, introduce the panel, so uh, Lee, where are you teaching lately? You're at the Cal State Northridge, okay. So uh, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and then next to her is uh, Robert St. Pierre. Robert, where are you teaching these days? I teach at Northridge, Cal State Northridge. Cal State Northridge, okay, okay. And then Dave Master, so Dave, what you been doing lately? Mountain climbing and backpacking. Okay, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm retired. Oh. Okay. But I taught animation for, uh, I don't know, 25 years. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I did the Acme Network for a number of years and started that. Mm -hmm. And um, taught high school 
animation for a long time, which doesn't sound like it'll get kids in, but Tom knows he used to visit the class. We oh, got yeah. hundreds of people into the studios right from high school. Oh, yeah. It was right maybe 20 minutes from here in Roland Heights, City of Industry. And um, we ended up getting uh, a lot of students into the business and they're doing really well. Yeah. So that's been what I've been doing. Yeah, I just remember that the, um, um, you know, Chuck Jones called me up one time and Chuck was like, Roland Heights, go talk to their class. I'm like, yes, sir. Like you don't argue with Chuck. Like Chuck tells you go someplace, you go. Yes, well, sir. Okay. I used to. I used to think that all these people wanted to go all the way the hell out to Roland Heights and somehow give us critiques and stuff. And then I found out years later that they all had their arms twisted and they didn't know where the heck they, Chuck was sending them or Frank Thomas or Ollie yeah. Johnston or uh, Bill Scott. Bill Scott. They all yeah. sent people out yeah. to help us because we didn't know what we were doing back yeah. then. And um, it, it was great. There's an article he wrote many years ago that's mm -hmm. accurate uh, in Animation World Network. Yeah. yeah. Uh, called The Prism. You yeah. just type in my name and put The Prism and you get the history. He wrote, yes. it. He wrote it up. Oh, good. So, so um, I just want to introduce Carol Ashley. And uh, Carol, what are you teaching these days? I'm at Cal State Fullerton. Okay, great. Good. And, um, and, and uh, I'm chair of animation at USC. Uh, at the USC Film School, so yeah. So the topic that we've been uh, that that we picked for this time is we're certainly living in an era of of politics, of polarized politics, one way or another. It's very controversial. There's uh, everybody has very strong opinions. Um, I remember uh, right after uh, the presidential election, I was actually overseas. I was in Florence, Italy. But, uh, but I heard that our dean actually called a town hall meeting for the students because the students were so traumatized by like everything that's been going on that they just give them an outlet where they could talk. And as anybody, you know, who's taught before knows, uh, a, a classroom is a little bit of a psychological tyranny. You know, like we all know teachers that are very strong personalities that are very pushy and they not only push their, their you, you know, what they want to teach the students, but also a bit of, uh, at times, a bit of their own personal taste, their own ethics or something can, tr can get into a class. Uh, I mean, I remember being at a, uh, um, a, 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 being in a seminar by a, 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 a author who's famous for teaching uh, about scripting, story and all. And these very good analysis of story structure and script structure. But a lot of times his own personal opinions would come in, you know, so he would sit there and go, George Lucas, a hack. Martin Scorsese, overrated. <laughs> you know? and you're like, wait a minute, I, I like Martin Scorsese movies. <laughs> so a lot of times, you know, you know, you're, as an instructor, your own personal taste can can come in, and and sometimes it could also affect politics, you know. And nowadays, people are so sensitive about uh, oh those dang liberal professors or those dang conservative professors or something. So just I thought it'd be interesting to have a discussion about just what are the parameters uh, of of uh, you know working with um, working with a class when the subject of um, of uh, national politics come up. So uh, just to sort of sort of open the discussion, um, I just think like like what are your own sort of personal views about how uh, uh, how and when to guide uh, this type of discussion in the classroom? Anybody want to throw that? Anybody want to jump on that? Well, I mean, I kind of came. My background uh, is I started way back a long time ago, actually as a student back in the '60s in the whole teaching movement. So as a student back then, um, this issue became really big. Mm. And so I experienced it from a student level uh, back at, you want me to put this? Yep. Is that okay? You hear? Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll just say it so we have it for the, everybody else who wants to see it. Um, I was in the student movement back in the 60s and the whole teaching movement started back then. And what that was is around this issue of putting, um, uh, having people be able to speak out. There were a lot of faculty who were not against the war in Vietnam, um, you know, maybe not so much in favor of the civil rights movement. There were many teachers who were very active in the civil rights movement and, the, um, and then later in the women's movement they were anti-war, um, and uh, 
and students were divided back then, uh, pretty much like it is now. And um, the, the principles that we developed back in the, te in the teaching movement were that everybody gets to speak and that we can disagree, but the whole idea back then was to get it out there. Uh, it wasn't until many years later that Shockley, the whole Shockley issue, it was a guy who actually did research supposedly about um, you know bell curves and and intelligence based on race and um, there was a lot of discussion back then about whether or not he should be able to speak on campus and that was the first time uh, we really saw this kind of issue uh, like today where people are saying they shouldn't even be able to have a right to speak there was also back then a big case in the in the midwest where nazis um, were gonna speak and rally and um, the whole movement was divided on whether or not they should be allowed to speak and the aclu position which most of us sided with was and we gave money to the aclu uh, was um, they should have the right to speak and we should have the right to demonstrate against them and that the idea was not to give the state the ability to decide who can speak because that could be turned against you um, you may be the dominant force one day and then you get a government in who disagrees totally and then they can stop you from speaking the next time because you've set a precedent and so um that's the time i i came from and i brought those kinds of similar principles into my classroom where um, my role as a teacher to try to get away from what tom was saying uh, my role as a teacher was to be more socratic and kids knew i was pretty liberal you know and things like that but my job wasn't to tell them what i felt uh, my job was to get them to explore a lot of possibilities to determine who they are and who they want to become so that's the general kind of principle that I've gone on throughout my career uh, as a student and then as a teacher. Um, that's the way I kind of looked at it. it you know, as, as a teacher, it's not about who I'm going to become because I'm an old guy now. I already became whatever it is. But it was to get my students uh, to become all that they can be and to develop their ideas. And I did encourage a lot of discussion. And I never got called out on it. I never got uh, complaints to counselors, to the school, to the district, or anything else. There was a lot of discussion in my classes, but it was basically student-driven and, and not mine. The other thing that I did, and I can go into case law on it, the other thing that I did that I thought um, go, keeps you in good legal stead is I would invite people to show their films, professionals, independents, to come and speak at my class. And their work spoke for itself, and then they would get in discussions. And the law, basically, it's real simple. It goes back to 1940, <laughs> uh, and this is still used in court on this issue, is if it's germane to the subject you're teaching, well, that's how it's gonna be decided in the courts. So if you're just spouting off, and making comments and dominating the discussion. And it's not germane to what the students are studying or the course that you're teaching. That's where you can get into trouble. And it's in the case law. I mean, I boned up, I'm retired now, so Tom had to make me work, you know. So I boned up on all the law and the case law on it. And that goes back to 1940 and all the new cases all go back to that particular thing. The other problem is that um, there's a difference between students' First Amendment rights and academic freedom. Academic freedom actually has nothing to do with students in case law. Nothing, zero. I mean, um, actually the law considers it that the school, the administration, and that teacher with peer review, as long as they're peer reviewed, pretty much sets up what the discussion is going to be in class what the parameters are as long as that is laid out to the students and if they stick to that they can't get in trouble okay now someone may want to have them peer reviewed or whatever it is but they legally are on safe ground if that is something they've discussed with their faculty it's been approved a book or whatever it is and in fact 
That's where academic freedom comes in. The teacher is the only one protected by academic freedom. So you can't get the two mixed up. The law doesn't care. They have two different definitions about who they um, pretty much protect. And academic freedom is to protect teachers against you know, uh, domination or censorship or whatever. So if a teacher says, I don't want to use this book, I want to use that book, and it's germane to the subject, the university, the state, nobody can make the teacher change that book. And so that is another critical area. We can get into it, but I, I think if everybody kind of knows what the difference between those two things are, and we can get into specific you know, cases, but if you can skirt those two things, you're on safe ground. And students also, the main thing is you're there to learn the subject. And I know that sounds like it's limiting and everything else, but you also have to look at the other side, have empathy for all of the other students in the class. And I knew that in my class. If I let a discussion go on too long, I mean, you know, with students were going back and forth over a question I raised Socratically, they would go, when are we gonna get back to the subject? And so that's a, another critical thing is where the teacher has to learn how to navigate these things and have the uh, judicious, you know, the judgment to know, is this turning into a political science class or is it still animation and how much? And then also, you know, off of that. Now, it's a little different nowadays than when I was teaching uh, the internet wasn't as big then because I did other things after I taught. Um, I went to Warner Brothers and all that. The internet is really big. It protects me and people like Bob. <laughs> um, the academic freedom law is to protect us and the freedom of speech law is to protect us, okay? Because we're online all the time, but we can't be discriminated against by what we post online. They can't fire us because what we post online, that's freedom of speech not academic freedom, but freedom of speech. And there's case law and that goes back to 1940 where people went and publicly spoke. So we're protected by the freedom of speech law in that case, not academic freedom. And okay, the I'm going to jump in here. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that, that you got right into the legality of it because I think, I know for me personally, that's what holds me back from even bringing it up is that I am, I'm afraid that I'm gonna get in trouble with the school or with the law or whatever. So, um, so I wanted to see if Carol had anything to say at this point. Yeah, I found that really interesting than what you were talking about because I don't feel particularly um, secure in, in just saying things or posting things in social media that reflect my political views and even bringing them up in class because I don't know how safe of an environment we are in today. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, we're talking about the 60s, and I think it happened a little bit in the 90s again when I was at CalArts. Things were very fiery and political and lots of demonstrations going on and silence equals death, and here we are again, um, almost 30 years later, um, looking at another political climate that to me feels very different and even more oppressive in a lot of ways. And I think um, just, uh, what's going on in terms of uh, gender issues and uh, women's rights right now, I think maybe the reason why Lee and I may feel less secure in speaking our voice is our gender, um, that we could potentially be a target. Um, so I have remained off of Facebook quite a bit. I post some pictures of my kids, but I don't post what I do anymore socially. Um, and I don't really speak up too much about what's going on because I'm sort of waiting to see what is going to happen. Um, you know, and that's kind of where I'm at right now with things. Robert, do you want to get in? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite um, politically conscious and active and also pretty boisterous with my position. And, um, but I, I do keep that out of the classroom. I think it's an important thing for me to uh, make sure that I'm neutral in my class. Um, but the political cycle that we've just gone through, I think, has just driven uh, anxieties uh, that have come into the classroom because of my students. I know that after the election, there were a few of my own students who 
uh, couldn't come to class for an entire week. They were just completely petrified. And I have some students who are in queer studies who have been petrified of what's been happening. So what I do is I sort of like, I'm not in a, I'm not in a position in a class that is a course that specifically relates to politics, but there are some students that bring those into their work and I'm completely open to discussing that. Uh, we typically have the students talk about their work openly, so I make sure that we have a safe environment for those students to uh, discuss their their concept, their idea, and there's no ridicule in my class. I'm, I'm pretty much in, in strong control of my class, and, and I'm intolerant to people laughing at other people or belittling, belittling them in any manner. So I think that my, my class understands that I have a firm grasp of the class, and so therefore it's, it's sort of like a safe environment. Um, but we have some students that, um, you know, really are having a struggle even today with the politics, and I think that they're really concerned about what's what's been happening. So I do allow that conversation to come up, and I do allow it to be something that will um, sort of like be driven in sort of like a neutral a neutral manner within my class. Um, I want to throw just a case thing here, um, because we're li uh, we're living in an era now where. Um, where, where everybody has electronic media, and and uh, you're always hearing about people taping other people, or like there's a conversation or something going on, and somebody will turn on their phone, and there have been examples of a student in a lecture, you know, a lecture hall like this, will record uh, a, a teacher and then take it to the administration and say. I don't like what this teacher is doing. He's imposing his views or he's imposing his agenda, his liberal agenda or conservative agenda or whatever on us. Um, what do you think is the teacher's rights in, 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 the, in, in that case? Well, there have been a, a number of cases on that. Um, I didn't, this is just on the general principles, what I was looking up. Yeah, um, you know, uh, the, um, the, the schools now have set up their own policies. So I would, if I was a teacher and a student, I would definitely go and look at the policy of your school on that because the legal decisions are based on what the school policy was about whether or not you can do that or not. And many schools, if not most, at least the ones who don't want to end up in court all the time, have set up policies where that's illegal or against the school's policy. So I would do it, I mean, I, there's, I'll, I'll just say it here so people have it. I would definitely, this is the American Association of University Professors, they've been around a long time, and they have set up um, guidelines. And I went straight there, among other things, I went straight there to find out what those things are. And it's, you know, I would just Google academic freedom, students and professors, and political discrimination. That's one more thing, okay? Uh, academic freedom, students and professors, and political di discrimination. And you can get this document and read it for yourself. But then you have to look at your school policy on that. And that's really how the court will determine it, uh, whether or not you're safe or not. That's all I got on it. Mm. Yeah, I think that deferring to school policy is, I think, the right course of action. Um, I haven't had that situation again. I think it's because I'm pretty neutral in my class, and and I don't tolerate um, many student belittling someone else for their opinion. So um, I make sure that it's a safe environment for them to talk openly. Uh, some of the students who have been more somewhat more traumatized by the election cycle, I've opened that up to my office hours, and I allow them to come. And some of them come with opposing views that I don't share, but I think it's important that they understand that all opinions are welcome. Uh, regardless, and I, th I think it's important and sort of like uh, necessary for us as faculty to really embrace that and, and try to leave our bias at the door and allow open conversation and political discourse. I, I think what Bob is doing there is by case law really the, the way to go. He, did, he said two things. One is he allows all opinions to be expressed and it's about the work. He said, I have students making films about such and such, and if they discuss it, it's about the work. That's critical in case law. If you're doing that, you're on very safe ground. Uh, two is when he brings someone in, and he doesn't allow people to have a free-for-all, okay? He has order. In fact, there were other things that I can bring up in here where there were groups that are trying to somehow figure this out, 
Um, and they really say that um, one of the important things is set up guidelines to let everybody know that you as a teacher have certain opinions. They may read your stuff on Facebook, right? And, but you don't want, it's not about me, it's about the so subject area. And it's not about me as a teacher, it's about you as a student, it's where you're going. So this whole thing revolves around them. And if it comes out of that, which you're doing, you're on safe ground. The other thing is, the only thing I would add, if you meet with, teach, with students afterwards, which is really critical, that's important to do, you have to document that. You should keep a logbook about what date, and what the discussion was about, and immediately after the student leaving, you should write down what the discussion was about, how it resolved, and just keep that logbook in your uh, thing, because that, in court, is really important to document that you've done everything you can to make it a safe environment for students, you've been open. Um, not only is it the right thing to do, <laughs> but it's also the legal thing, legally safe thing to do. So I wanted to ask Robert, actually, um, so the people that are traumatized that come to you afterwards, um, um, who, who are they and what is their trauma? I mean, I think I have well, an idea. Well, Jim, oh wait, not supposed to mention names, right? No, <laughs> no, no, no I, mean, I mean, what is, uh, what is the thing that worries them the most, I guess? Well, most of them are uh, Hispanic or they're queer and they have uh, issues with uh, the policies that our, our new administration is going with. So um, that's pretty much that demographic. And um, you know, they're, they have uh, parents they've expressed that are uh, not documented, so they're fearful of what's gonna happen there. They're actually afraid to go out of the house. They're, uh, you know, to, to establish something like that, or the new laws, or not the laws, but the new um, position that the administration has to ban certain people. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's really infringing on our ability at the at university levels, uh, even corporate levels, to, to move forward with, uh, you know, the appropriate people for the, or, or, you know, blocking students from coming to the states because, you know, of their specific religion or, or whatnot. So, so, but typically they are more Hispanics and, uh, and queer students. Um, Carol, do you, do you bring these subjects up in class at all or just completely mm -hmm. avoid them? <laughs> I don't think I do either. I mean, I if I were teaching something that were more in line with talking about political topics or even something like animation history, I think that would be a great forum to bring a lot of this up and do comparisons to, um, you know, propaganda films of the 40s versus, you know, fake news of today. Um, but I'm teaching more nuts and bolts principles of animation class, and I think students are more worried about hot keys on Maya than... <laughs> than <laughs> you know what's going on but i mean you know the day after the election when i came in it was a very uh somber room and um i asked if they wanted to talk about it and most of them said we just want to work you know and um so we kind of got to work and you know we're focusing on our projects for class um but something that i did notice that uh, a trend that started happening um as the executive orders were coming out especially the ones on immigration, um, that my class size started to uh, fade. So enrollment started, or uh, attendance started dropping, and I looked out at my classroom to see who was there and who wasn't there, and it was the population that you were just speaking of. Most of my, I had one Hispanic kid left, so the, the classroom was predominantly white, Asian, and a few others in there, and, um, for obvious reasons, you know, and I wish I had had the opportunity to have conversations with them, but I think there was so much fear at that time that a lot of them left. A few have come back, um, but most of that uh, population in my classroom is gone right now. If I can add something too, I think that um, being the Cal State University uh, system, we rely heavily on a demographic that's underserved. And so the policies that are uh, being put forth now are really going to impact us. And I think that that's something we have to be conscious of. Uh, we really need to educate our, our students. And when we have barriers that are set up that discourage that, it's, it's going to be a, a big impact that we all have to, have to really contend with um, at one point. It would be good if we, um, if we had, you know, it would be good if we had uh, someone here from a private institution because the laws actually are different. And, um, you know, maybe if we, if this con continues this discussion, 
um, or we had another forum, that would be a good one because uh, private institutions are not bound by the same thing as state institutions as far as freedoms of what you can talk about. And so... Um, well, Carol and I and Mike have all taught at uh, private yeah. institutions, for-profit. Yeah. Yes. What, while <laughs> this have. kind of stuff was going on? No, not while this yeah. is going on. So um, I don't know what the atmosphere is like. Mm -hmm. um, I was the former, I'm the former department chair at the Art Institute of uh, Hollywood. Um, and that is a demographic that was being served there as um, uh, Hispanic and African American. So I don't know what's going on there. I mean, Lee, I think you may have, are you out of touch with that as well now? Uh, no yeah, I haven't there. been there for about a year. Well, I'm, I'm just speaking yeah, from a legal sense that they have a complete, because they're private. Yeah, right. They don't have to abide by a lot of the freedom of speech things and all of that. They can set up a lot of their own rules, so it's a different issue. So I'm, when I'm speaking here, I'm only speaking about the things you guys are involved in now. But for me, I worked for the art institutes for mm. a dozen years at um, two different campuses and uh, three different campuses. And... Uh, yeah, they had their own rules, and to me, it felt even more strict. It mm. felt it Absolutely. felt as if uh, nationwide they, were, they were constantly worried about getting sued. <laughs> right. No, and it, it is strict. That's the point I'm making: is that if anybody's on listening to this, working in a private institution, I want to make that disclaimer right there: you have to look at your school's policy because if it's a private one, you even have more restrictions because they call the shots. That's true. I just had a thought. I was thinking of, a, of an example, um, which is tangential, but it's still relevant. And that was uh, a couple of years ago, and I was I was teaching Cal Arts, and I remember one of the um, one of the instructors was of a more um, uh, you know um, religious bent, you know, thing. He was more conservative in terms of his uh, outlook on religion, and um, one of his students was sort of emerging uh, sexually as a, you know, as a gay person, it was sort of coming out and was kind of exploring themes and everything in his films. So in his films, he was doing a lot of uh, homoerotic sort of uh, imagery. And this instructor said that, he, you know, he actually tried to dissuade him and say, you know, you know, are you sure that's an appropriate subject for your film? You know, and and you know, and he asked me about, it and I said, you know, it's none of your business. You know, I mean, I mean, you shouldn't really tell a student what they should or shouldn't do. It just does it move well? You know, like is it moving? You know, is, is it is it is it animated correctly? Not the not the subject matter. It really shouldn't be part of it. You know, it's like wow. is the subject matter clear and compelling? Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So 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 I, I, I mean, did you ever have that kind of situation of like somebody having something that you, you know? you try not to let your own personal taste sort of intercede on the subject matter itself. I have some experience with that. I've had some students that have dealt with uh, some questionable manner uh, or matter. And also I have other students who might produce, uh, this isn't political specifically, but really gory, you know, really questionable. Like, oh man, you know, I'm questioning like, should I have to keep my eye on this character because I'm not sure if he's gonna come back to the room with a gun. You know, like really shaky stuff. It's like, geez. But my comment to them is, I don't discourage it. I'll always, I always preface it by saying, listen, I'm not telling you what to do, but I am trying to tell you, you're going into a commercial industry. You're trying to prepare a portfolio that has to be absorbed into the industry, Disney, DreamWorks. And if you show, you know, like a hatchet going through someone's head, I don't think that that's really going to be conducive to a, a portfolio that's worthy of the big studios. So um, again, I always preface preface it by specifying that I'm not trying to tell you what to do, you do whatever you want, but I do want to give you a heads up. If you have a body of work like this that isn't, and this could apply to political, it can apply to anything, um, but if it's not conducive to what a, um, a studio portfolio should look like, uh, you're sort of like biting yourself um, already, you know, you're jeopardizing your ability to get into a studio. So that's as far as I go with, with respect to that, but trying to give them some, you know, industry uh, suggestions pretty much. This, uh, I think Bob is, again, right on the on money. And he meets the standards of what uh, the legal cases are, is that um, censoring students, especially over 18-year-olds, college students, um, is a very difficult road to hoe. And the stuff that Tom brought up, uh, the best way to deal with these things is to talk about what are the standards in the industry? Where do you want to work? What are those portfolio standards? What will they do? And Try to get someone from studios to look at the work with that student and tell them privately why that might not, you know, since, I mean, 
Tom used to go to, and when we world worked at Warner Brothers, we used to have these reviews of student work while they'd all eat tuna fish sandwiches in the, in the lounge and, and they'd look at the work and, um, you know, it's a vote. I mean, people make their cases for somebody, but essentially uh, you really want to pretty much tailor your portfolio to what that studio you want to get into. Now, here's one thing. I don't know if any of you are teaching high school or anything. I taught high school. It's a whole other ball game. Under 18 year olds, uh, they, they do that stuff. Um, there are other rules and laws that you need to look at. Uh, I had one girl who did that kind of work. She looked like Shirley Temple. Now, for many of you, you don't know who she is, but you know, she was really prim and proper, right? And uh, she made films where every single character and made a film where every single character ate the other characters, killed them and ate them. <laughs> so, no joke, this is many, many years ago, back in the 70s, so I went to the counselor and I said, I just wanna show you this film. I need you, need you to take it from here. I am not a psychologist but I think there's something going on here. And it turned out that she was living a Sybil environment in her house. And there was um, professional intervention, legal intervention, everything else. And it was all portrayed in a film. You would have never guessed that this girl, uh, through her film, she let it out. But because she wasn't 18, I knew I had to bring this to somebody and I wasn't the one that was gonna try to do it deal with it. So that's a really important thing if you're dealing, and some of you college teachers probably have people under 18, because some people graduate and get into college when they're 17, 16, and the laws are different. So if you think the student is underage, you need to really, um, then it's a different set of standards that, and different legal things you're held to. I hate to be the lawyer here because I'm not, I don't have a law degree, but I just read up on this stuff, so. We get cases at USC where um, sometimes the, the parents will try to contact us directly and they'll say, I don't like what my child is doing. You know, I don't like what my son or daughter is doing or I don't like the kind of stuff they're doing. And our attitude is like, if, if they're over 18, then privacy takes over. So legally, that person's an adult. That person can go in the army. You know, it's like, so. So you know, unless they sign, uh, like we actually make them sign a waiver, uh, a clearance that 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 the student grants permission for the parent to talk to the faculty. Otherwise, we can't talk to them because because they're now adults, and it's like they have a right to privacy just like any other adult does. That's right. He's right on the money legally. <laughs> Robert, did you have something? Uh, no, actually, I think what um, Tom just touched base on it was going to discuss. Just, uh, um, I had another scenario too, and that is, what if you have like a student who wants to make a, a personal film, and the personal film is like kill the faggots, you know, and then and then a you know a gay student will come to you and say, you know, what what such and such, you know, you know what what Bill is doing or something is is I find very distasteful and it's upsetting me. How do you handle that as faculty when it's student to student? I, I haven't encountered that myself, so I, I can't really uh, speak to that specifically. But I did want to just quickly touch base too on something that Dave had mentioned, um, and that was that um, I think we have an obligation uh, as faculty, if we see some student who has some uh, ongoing issues with their work, questionable, like the one that I had, uh, you know, they had these hooks that they'd put in pigs and hang them and they're like, you know, really some, his, his, his storylines were consistently dark and concerning. Uh, so that was my obligation to bring that to my department chair's attention. I think if we don't and something happens, uh, we could be liable for some um, cases after that. We've had some students as well in the past uh, where they were uh, tried to encourage to go into a, an internship. They didn't get the internship and then they, they wrote a scathing letter to the president of that intern of the company for the internship with profanity. It's like, oh my gosh. So those are really concerning and they're out of our control. But you know, we have to be conscious and sensitive when we see some issues that are potential concerns. I think we have to be responsible to bring those to the attention of our department chair and then let them take the decision from that point forward. And it's hard because you don't want to rat out on a kid. But also, you know, you have to sort of like protect yourself and the students and, and even him. And I think that 
Dave's example of, of this, this poor girl, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what was uncovered out of that is just horrifically tragic. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think Bob again is right on the money. I didn't have to read all this stuff. We could have just listened to Bob today. Um, the, but no, it comes out of our practice, all of us. I mean, every single thing I've heard up here comes out of practice, and they're all valid. And because every, not only are we, all of us, and I go through it less because I'm retired, um, but everybody who's in uh, the field is going through it now. It, all, all of these points that everybody's making, the discrimination, the potential of threat, all of this stuff, I mean, there are a lot of people who aren't speaking out and aren't doing a lot of things because it's so unclear whether or not you're gonna really get yourself in hot water. You may be, you may be totally legal, okay? But you make a great point because, yeah, you'll win in the end probably, especially if you do all of these things. But do you wanna go, people are afraid, do I really want to spend the next year of my life in court fighting this? and having my union fight it. So this is a chilling thing. And you know, I mean, it, it, it isn't that you wouldn't win, right. but it's like, you is that what you want to spend your time? Yeah. Really. And so, and, and someone who's more political and not afraid of that might choose the other direction. Okay, so that's the key. I, could I just say one other thing on this issue, I think is really critical, is set up systems in your class about these things. It's really important to go to people and find out what your legal thing is, your state law, your school rules, and the federal protections you have. And also this AAUP, just look them up. You wanna know from every single avenue, including if you're in a teacher's union. So if you're, you're feeling queasy, I'm a backpacker, and I get out in the woods and I'm out there for like 20 days, and if I'm feeling queasy about something, there's probably a good reason. And so the thing is, if you have any question about it, I would go and check. I would go to your, and that basically in court, that will stand up as, hey, you went and asked. Right away, you're in better stead than if you try to fumble it yourself. Um, I wanted to touch back on what Professor Cito um, asked. Is there an issue? Well, actually, I want to throw something in there. Actually. Yeah. You know, and also the point you made about the homophobic film. Uh, there are laws about hate speech. So right away, you need to look, about, look at that and, and inquire, what is the school policy? What is the state law? And what is the federal law on that? And there are laws at three levels on that. Um, so I wanted to take that part um, and um, talk a little bit about sexism. Um, because I, I seem to remember, now that I've thought about your question, I seem to remember there being some, some projects and films in Atlanta that were just kind of on the edge of sexism. <laughs> they weren't blatant anti-woman, but it might be because of the type of music that the student was using behind their film. Um, so that might be something that we could ask about, how other people would handle that if they noticed it. Anybody? <laughs> you want me to jump in there with that? Yeah. yeah. yeah like if somebody's doing a film and the, the soundtrack is smack my bitch up. You right, know, right. It's like, what, Th what thank you, you for voicing uh, what I... What's wrong with that? Was too shy to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really uh, um, kind of precarious and uncomfortable position to be in, I think, as a faculty and even as a student. I, re I remember being a student at CalArts and dealing with sort of the reverse of that where someone had made um, not an anti-gay film but a pro-gay film and everybody kind of just assumed that it was cool with all the other students and the faculty was fine with it and then all of a sudden we had one white male student who just blew his top over this and was just so offended by it and watching that instructor handle that and and continued the discussion of 
you know, one person who really opposed it and was offended, and then everybody else trying to understand what was so offensive to you about this. Um, so those are really, um, I think they're important discussions to have and, and just to keep in uh, uh, kind of a neutral position about it, but, um, and, and an opportunity, I think, to bring forward, you know, what is it, what are the social conditionings happening that make you think that this sort of thing is okay to, you know, put, you know, whatever, you know, uh, imagery about women to objectify them or whatever that is, um, you know, how do you think that's going to be perceived by, uh, you know, women? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't had that in my classrooms yet, um, but I think for me, I would just probably keep a, a, an open dialogue around that and then look at the deeper issues, look at the core issues around. Um, it's not just coming from that student individually, it's, it's coming from society, it's coming from social conditioning. I mean, we're seeing it splattered all over the place right now and, and just how, uh, uh, women are being treated in, in this political climate, you know. Um, our first lady walking down a flight of stairs by herself as the president walks on <laughs> by himself. Um, and um, yeah, I think just keeping a really open position about that and, and talking about some of the, the bigger issues of, uh, that our, our society is um, based on. And, you know, um, this isn't legal, but in a lot of the reading that I did, um, they keep coming back to what we really should be talking about is um, what is the fertile soil for learning? And how do you prepare young people for a world that is changing all the time and needs to have a lot more tolerance of a lot of ideas and also needs to move forward and challenge a lot of the bad ideas, bad things that um, are, have held humans back, um, like sexism, like racism, um, you know, uh, a lot of the things that are uncomfortable, but it's part of the world. I mean, I used to put my students, where I ran my classroom like a studio. Uh, I didn't have just classes in certain subjects. It was more of a music conservatory, but an animation where they just made films and everything was learned in that context. And, um, Essentially, that was difficult for a lot of students. They had never been in a class like that before because they just usually learned a particular thing. And um, this co it's called cognitive dissonance when you're confronted with ideas that completely um, blow you away. It's totally out of your realm, okay? So you may have been raised uh, in a family that was sexist or racist or whatever. You get into a school and then all of a sudden this person is confronted with people who are not homophobic and who um, actually feel that it's it's great that someone lives the life they want. And that becomes very challenging for that person. But the job, especially of a university, it's different in a high school situation, I won't get into that, but um, in, a, in a university, that's the point. <laughs> and so I don't wanna just get into all the legal things, but if you can manage, and this is where a good teacher who kinda knows how to Socratically deal with these issues, and you bring in empathy. I mean, essentially, let's go back to the, the really important things, the reasons for university and reasons for learning. And, and cognitive dissonance, and there's a great quote, um, and I could share this article with people, um, but uh, there's a great quote by a guy, Chris Sloan, and uh, he talks about teaching the art of civil dialogue. And he basically, I'll just read you a, a real brief phrase. He says, um, uh, when our own assumptions are challenged, however, research shows that learning gains are greatest in these moments of cognitive dissonance. Meaning, the, fertile, the most fertile soil as a university or any teacher is when someone is challenging what they know and what they feel. Even if they come back to their original position, that's the whole job of the university in a nutshell, is to get students to actually challenge, not come in and leave the same way they were, but to actually consider other people's opinions, other people's feelings, and be empathetic. And that's not a legal opinion, okay? 
But it's really important that those kinds of things we don't completely eliminate from our classroom. But we need to do it in a non-threatening and a non-preachy kind of way. Um, I was just thinking too about, you know, nowadays too, uh, like you say that, you know, uh, people are so media conscious, they're also sort of media savvy. And a lot of, a lot of um, times they're schooled in the kind of guerrilla tactics, whatever that, that hap occur in media, where you would have somebody say, well, I want to, um, I want to make a film about my religious views and in my religious views, all gays and Muslims are going to hell and they should all die. And if you tell me I can't do that, then you're infringing upon my First Amendment rights for freedom of religion. So, so like, how do you how do you handle that? Yeah. I think the same thing we've been saying. Bob said it, and I told, I think legal things that you you that is not your decision as a teacher at that point. And I think you need then to go to the authorities and and talk about where what are the legal ramifications. Where does I mean. All of these things, if you read a lot of this stuff, case law is still being developed because those situations come up. And so the reality of that is where does hate speech start and where does someone's right to free speech end? And that you may become a test case. I, don't, I didn't read any test cases on that. But if that does happen, that will be tested in court. And those are the, um, I mean, you know, there's a bunch of things in here where they talk about the squishiness of the, of the law because not every case, and I think it's a great point you're raising, you may find yourself in this situation and you shouldn't go it alone. You need, you're in a community, an academic community, you're in a community at large of, of your society, and you need to reach out to other people and find out what are your rights and then what are the limitations. Because if you allow that to happen, and it's hate speech, right, it's a problem. And if you try to stop it, but do it in a, in, a, in a way that's authoritarian, you're infringing on someone's rights. And so the thing is that you need, you're not a lawyer, so you need to get uh, you know, um, the authority's position on it and not put yourself in danger. Um, one thing that I do, and I, I it touches on what you said before, is that to, to remind them of the professionalism aspect of whatever they're creating is going to go on their reel or on their website, um, and it could mean that they wouldn't get a job somewhere if they're doing something that's offensive. And then something that <laughs> tends to work that I've been doing a long time is like, we may use your work in the demo reel for the school, or we might put some of your artwork in the catalog, and uh, they're not going to want to put that in the catalog, and that, that usually works. <laughs> I, think, I think, Lee, you are totally on the money here, because um, essentially, I used to do a thing, Tom knows this, because he was a part of it, called the Who Says. And every two weeks, I had people visit the class, and I would let them speak for about 15 minutes about their own work, but my kids knew who they were, and had could Tell, talk about scenes in their films that they did. So that wasn't the important part, was to have a good dog and pony show and having these people come. The who says was, I wanted them, and he had to do it, and everybody who came had to do it. I wanted them to look at the student's work. And then in the end, I would t ask the person, put them on the spot and say, okay, you like that work. Is it portfolio ready? Would you hire a student who could do work like that on a consistent basis? And I remember the first time I did that, it was tough on the professionals. So they go, well, Dave, I'm just happy your kids aren't stealing hubcaps over cars moving down the street. I mean, you know, but this is good for them. I go, no, that isn't what, this, the, what we want to be doing here. And essentially, having um, people look at the work and say that, that that isn't appropriate, we would really question having that person and those feelings in our studio does more for dealing with this problem than any of this other stuff we're talking about. Because in the end, that's all that matters to students. And having the outside person, not dealing with it as a teacher, but having people from the studios come in and go, you know, that would be really questionable. And you might find that most studios would not want someone who expressed those ideas. 
and didn't realize what we're looking for to be working here. Um, example, and um, and this is a true example. Um, I had a student who was from uh, from China, and um, and uh, he was a very good artist. And everything. and and uh, one assignment that I would give to students, uh, uh, you know, as a group thing, is, is I would say, uh, I would say, have a character do something behind another character's back, like have a character do something that the another character is unaware of. And the example is like stealing candy from a baby, you know, like something like that. So anyway, so this student took this away and came back and did a beautifully animated scene of a young woman walking across campus and a guy comes up and stabs her repeatedly in the chest and blood squirting everywhere. And it's beautifully animated, but the class was traumatized and the kid was like, what? What did I do? <laughs> You're just like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was, I mean, the fact that it was so well done is like, was why it was upsetting. <laughs> I'm just like going, that's not really a good subject. <laughs> but if you bring a professional in and they look at that, that's yeah. good fertile soil for learning, right? The, start, the student then learns from the field yeah. Yeah. And what's acceptable. And the whole class learns. That's the other great thing. So I wanted to talk about the rest of the country. <laughs> we, uh, we have an advantage that we live and work here. Um, the, the entire state politically seems to be fighting everything that the current administration is doing, which is great. And, <laughs> sorry. Oh, that was my opinion. Um, <laughs> um, plus, I know that all of the, it seems that all the college university systems have leaders who have written letters to all the faculty saying that, no, we're not going to ship out any immigrant students, um, legal or otherwise. Um, and I, I really like that one letter that came out um, toward the end of the year last year that pointed at the, um, the economics of shipping out so many illegal students. The, the, the college system would collapse, basically, because we, lose, we would lose so many students. Um, so we do have an advantage in that we live and work in this state, uh, but I know that there are a few of us who have worked Culture. elsewhere where things wouldn't be so easy and we wouldn't feel supported so much by our university. So I thought if anybody wanted to talk about that, and if you haven't personally done it, maybe you know someone who has, who's struggled with what's it like to teach in the rest of the country. And, and I should point out, too, you know, Lee makes a good point that, you know, we're talking from the point of view of living in California, you know, the famous left coast. But it's like you're from Georgia. I'm from New York City. Dave's from New York. Where, where are you from? from you're from here. There you go. There's a native. There's one. It's got, okay. Robert, what about you? I'm from Where Connecticut you? originally. Okay. All right. So. But I know that Carol and Harvey both taught in Georgia yeah. for a while. Yeah. How was it different? Well, I was at the private school, so. Um, yeah, I think it's more restrictive there. And just in terms of what you can express openly. Right. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I was at a school where the faculty were often frightened of the of administration to express their, you know. Uh, but in terms of dealing with the students, I don't think there was too much. I had one quest thing which I doesn't deal with production; it deals with uh, uh, a th written thesis, and some student. I, as on my dissertation committee, I ha had to fire somebody because they weren't communicating with me. And also, I found out they didn't like my thesis topic, that person. And I fired them. And I always made a point of telling my students who was on a committee, I don't, if I don't like it, I'm going to tell you. And maybe I, you shouldn't have me on my commi committee. And I had one student who 
was writing a cinema studies, um, I'm sorry, um, thesis on a filmmaker whose name I forget, who fil animated films seem to induce epileptic fits. Oh. I, said, I don't want to be near it. And I told him, you know, I don't want to be on your committee because it's, it's not fair to you. And he didn't push it. I'm not sure what have happened. He says, I insist upon you being on my committee. Um, so I don't know if that's a topic. You know. I know some astrophysicists can, can cause epilepsy. So the yellow submarine. Yeah, yellow submarine. Yeah. Well, the, you know, I'll just real briefly. This, in case law, there is a difference. And in your state, don't forget, your, the first challenge will be in your state. And how states interpret whether or not something is freedom of speech, academic freedom, or whether it's, you know, whatever, is going to be in that state. So if you look at cases in, you know, certain states, I won't mention, um, the first time, you will lose many times where you might win in California or New York or Massachusetts you might be upheld and protected. You, on the first go round, you may lose. So now you've added more time. There will be an appeal. <laughs> and you will maybe prob probably win if it gets, if it finds merit and goes up into an appellate court and higher up, you, you will probably win. But you will be in a longer fight depending on where you are. That's how it works. So I don't make the rules. <laughs> I find that for the most part in um, art departments or in art schools, um, um, the students and the other teachers tend to be liberal anyway, no matter where you're living. So that was helpful. <laughs> I mean, mm. but I grew up there, so everybody that I know that I grew up with disagrees pretty much with my, pretty much everybody that I know disagrees with my political views. Everybody that I grew up with went to high school with and all that. I was just thinking, I, just thinking, uh, uh, um, I have a number of uh, people I work with in the film business that are originally from Texas, you know, people like Sarah Petty and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and I was joking with them. I said, how come everybody I know from Texas is a liberal? And then they go, we're here, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I see. So. Actually, it's getting closer in Texas if you look at the polls. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know. see. So. And Georgia. Yeah, Georgia. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, would there, uh, have any questions come up online? Uh, uh, Patrick, is anything going on? Or oh, Katie, oh, 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 Katie was keeping on. Okay. All right. Well, when she comes back, we'll ask her. Is there anything for our, from our online audience? If any comments or something? Anybody here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have a question? Yeah. What? So, no well, singing. So, <laughs> one of the things um, that I did about projects was that um, either students get assigned projects to do, so this is your assignment, and they're kind of stale. So, when students decide, you know, they get their own work and they're like, I can do this, whatever I can do, um, it all has to be pre approved. So we're never surprised at the end, like, oh my God, what did the student do? Um, so the student has to get approval from the instructor about their idea um, and about what they're gonna do. And then they can, if the instructor says no, then, then the student can come to me as, as chair and I'll convene the other instructors and we'll make a decision and yes or no. But to be honest, really it hasn't, that particular thing hasn't, come up in quite a while, the, the extreme violence. Um, we've had problems with music beds. So like rap music, like, you know, that there's a lot of, you know, the, the, the work might be okay, but the Sorry. music underneath is, you know, and that's just what they're used to, you know, kids are used to that. So I just wanted to say that you can protect yourself um, by having established some kind of guidelines so that the students know what you're expecting 
that you're not just open to any kind of ideas as far as projects that they have to go through approval and that kind of thing. Um, I used to just tell my students, I said, we are going to create a positive environment in the classroom. I'm giving you a lot of freedom in terms of what type of projects can you produce, but these are the things I can't tolerate. And I was wondering if that's actually something legal, because I would tell them no extreme violence. Uh, I've seen so many very interesting projects. Some of it I actually literally had to throw in the garbage, like the DVD that was on because I couldn't possess it. It was that disturbing. Or, or I don't know, I had projects where someone created a motion design piece on how Obama is a dictator, and I still remember how my classroom was frozen. We were just frozen, and I said, well, okay, this is the feedback I'm giving you because these elements were not working, but I refrained from you know, expressing my opinion. And I do see that sometimes I just say, you know, everybody has their political opinion, everybody has the right to feel and think the way they want to, but this is not the platform to display that. So I wonder if that's something that I may want to consider not saying. of, you know, when you were touching on violence is that, you know, there's that, you know, everybody kind of goes through that phase where they really enjoy movies like Saw and, you know, uh, you know, the splatter films, you know, with lots of killing and slashing and blah, 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 stuff and all. And it's like, you know, and, 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 you know, as you get older, you're sort of horrified by it. But like, you know, when you're young, it's like, that's cool. Look, you he sawed his head off. Oh, cool. You know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and yeah, and you want to be like, you you, you know, the students want to express their, their themselves, and sometimes they're, they're inspired by it. I mean, yeah, I know some really lovely people who like to make splatter movies, you know? They got the little jars of red corn syrup, and, you know, all over the place, and, and that's just what they're into, you know? So it's like, are we imposing our own personal taste by saying, I find that violence offensive or sexist? I don't know, you know, you, you know, because more often than not and everything, it's always like that there's always a sexual element in it. It's always like young kids going off by themselves in the haunted house and then the killer is there, you know. So, uh, yeah, like at what point do you draw the line and say, OK, well, that's that's too much, uh, you know, so. Um, I also wanted to get back to the issue of um, um, Okay, so how do we connect these two things, animation and politics? How do we connect them in the classroom? Is there, is there a way, obviously we can do it in history. So I'm very happy to hear stories of how you teach history, how you teach um, um, political upheaval and how it relates to animation. Well, legally, that's where you're safest. If you're teaching that and not, you know, uh, technique and, and technical, you know, technique and technical, you're safest if you're teaching something like that, especially you're completely safe if you write up your curriculum and you put in your source material, the films you're going to show and the books that you're going to read and the articles that you're going to cite uh, and you want your students to read. And that is peer reviewed. Your department uh, agrees with you. You are completely, I mean, anybody could take anybody to court on anything. But it will probably get thrown out of court pretty quick because there's so much precedent. But even if it proceeded, you would win. And so, yes, if, if you want to talk politics about things or discuss that with your class and to delve into that, I know Tom, uh, Tom and I both love that. Um, but the thing is, what you do is you teach a class like that, and it shouldn't be a class on Maya right. where all of a sudden you're, you know, you're doing polemics about politics. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, you know, maybe just using some common sense and, um, you know, if you're going to be showing Fritz the cat is to like give a warning, a shot ahead of time and to, you know, choose a clip if you're going to show something that's not going to be so incredibly offensive mm -hmm. instead of playing the whole film without Good any luck. notification <laughs> to the students of what's going to happen. Um, so I think there's, you know, sort of mm -hmm. that common sense piece and, you know, I want to kind of, uh, come back to um, some of the things that you were touching on before about bringing in industry professionals. 
who can reflect back to the students, um, you know, whether or not this is really something that's going to be appropriate for a real um, and getting uh, employment in the industry. Um, we had a recruiter out this week um, from Riot Games, and he just had some really important information to tell the students that, you know, they have a 12 to 18 month sort of courtship period where they are looking at candidates. And they're not just looking at the work that they're doing and how well they can model a environment and how many tries are in there. They're actually going out on social media and seeing how that person lives their life and whether or not that's going to be a fit for their studio environment. And the students, I think, were really surprised by that, you know, that what they are putting out on social media and what kind of tweets they're making are actually being followed by recruiters. Mm -hmm. And um, That's a great point. You know, he really made a point, you know, I'm going to hire the person who I see is, um, you know, doing work and engaging things, you know, that seems socially appropriate as opposed to the person, you know, drinking and partying all night and not wanting to go to work in the morning and saying, you know, F Mondays, you know. Um, <laughs> mm. They're going to make a decision on that. So um, It's a public forum. It is. They can look at and it. And he said, you know, I can't ask these questions as a recruiter. I can't ask if you have a family or do you drink or do drugs. But it, once it's out on social media, it's public and it's mine and I can watch it. Mm. No, this, that is critical with young people. And way, way back when, when I was teaching in high school, this is a long time ago, um, and social media was just starting back then, they were already telling students that, you know, that kind of thing. Because the large studios, um, they have basically, because I, I was at Warner Brothers when, and, and ran, um, you know, tra uh, training, um, they look at everything. They really need to know that they're hiring someone that can do the job and will fit into their community. And uh, they will look at everything. And it's their right to. I should, uh, oh yeah, I should make an interesting point too, and that is if you w work with um, a university address, like an EDU email and all, remember the, the issue that email is not private. It's owned by your university. You know, I, I know um, I had that when I was when I was a uh, union president that um, that uh, a negotiator like during a during a, a dispute was waving transcripts of people's emails because apparently when the when the when email was first constituted, there was a lawsuit to try to declare email mail as mean, meaning private. So it's so private messages, and that was fought in court by mm -hmm. like Disney and Apple and Microsoft and all, of them. and they basically got that reversed. So to say that if they own the system, like if they own the email that you're using, they have the right to read your emails. And 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 I've had that happen in the university too. During a university dispute, a dean said, "You sent this email," you, you know. So, so they can legally do that. So if you are Discussing something private or of a questionable nature, do it on your private email server, not on an EDU. Um, Robert, do you ever discuss history in your classes at all? No, I don't. But my courses don't necessarily. I mean, I'll, I'll use uh, reference once in a while, but it's not a major driving force in my classes. All right. Um, so, uh, Professor Cito and Professor Dineroff, you, you two are our historians. And uh, that keeps coming to my mind. Um, issues like the uh, uh, blacklisting of the 50s. That's a, that's a big one. Um, um, because it's now known that the purpose of that was to, you know, take the air out of some liberal um, progressive activities. Chilling effect. Yeah. Um, but then I also, I have to discuss racism when I teach this super early history because of the uh, some of the offensive little silent cartoons that are that were made during that time so if either of you want to speak yeah. to that it's it, it, it's interesting because I've had some uh, uh, you know like recently whatever I've had black students who say they have no problem with coal black and the seven dwarves because they understand that it was in its time period 
it was the early 20th century, and that the people who were making, who were doing those images were also doing derogatory images of everybody. Like everybody had, you know, was caricatured grotesquely and, and stereotyped and all. And, and then I've had other black students who say, no, it still bothers me. You know, it's, it's still, a, you know, and you really have to sort of, you know, you don't strike that balance. Like you can't tell them, oh, ignore it. You know, you know, any more than a sexist thing. You know, like the, the like it used to be in the '60s when, when you know somebody would pinch a girl or would grab them or something, and then and then her friends would say, oh, don't be an old maid or prissy about it. You know, it's he didn't mean any harm. So it, it's we're in a different sort of era now than in that time period, but. What we, I, I know what I try and teach is just that it's in its time period, and particularly the 30s and all in the 40s were very ethnically conscious. You know, like if you look at films from the era and everything, they sort of played up the ethnicity of people, almost like saying that this is the quilt of America. You know, like if you look at a film like Footlight Parade, you know, you, you know they have all these different guys at a bar, you know, where he says, you know, I offered her castles on the Rhine. And then it's a curly haired guy going, oi, I offered her all of Palestine, oi, you know? <laughs> like, and they would just do these like little, little vignettes, you know? And it was just, in, in the 30s, it was acceptable, it was okay. You know, and now it's 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 like now it's kind of seen as more culturally insensitive. So, I I, I taught a lot of history, uh, both film and animation, and it's you. What Tom was saying about different perceptions of races, racism, and the one favorite I, I could teach it in film history more than animation history is bring up uh, the jazz singer, which is universally considered rather racist because Al Josen goes out and uh, sings in blackface. But the history of this film is that it was, Al Josen was a hero to the African Americans. And the film was uh, eagerly anticipated in black communities and there was theaters which uh, couldn't show sound version and they they would have uh, people singing, you know, hiking. Uh, and so I would go into the history of why that was so. And it has to go, uh, I can't really go into it now. There is a wonderful article in Film History Magazine about this. So, and it's a great discussion point to uh, say, you know, be careful taking what you perceive as racist, sexist, and so forth, and putting it in the proper context. What is the background? Uh, why was Al Jolson a hero to the African American community? And, uh, and so forth. Well, I know that Floyd Norman has said that he likes um, Cold Black and the Seven Dwarfs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he remembers when it came out and he they thought of it as, wow, we have our own cartoon. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, but yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just like, I used to know, uh, you know, everybody heard of the character Speedy Gonzalez. And stuff. I used to know the guy it was based on. There was, a, there was an animator named Frank Gonzalez, and he was an assistant at Warner Brothers, and he was one of the fastest assistants, and his nickname was Speedy. And, and, and apparently, like, he, uh, they had a drawing quota, and everybody had to finish their drawings at a certain point, and Frank was the first guy finished. And then, and, and, you know, and then he'd be, you know, and uh, the other artists would be working, and they'd, f they'd see somebody walk past them, and they'd go, who's that? And go, oh, it's Speedy. Uh, you know. And then around 1953, when the Warner Brothers sent a memo and they said, well, the old characters, you know, have been played so long now, can we introduce some new characters? And Chuck Jones and Holly Pratt, the designer, went, Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> you know, and that's when they, they kind of came up with the name. But, you know, now the imagery and then some of the other characters, like this one called Slowpoke Rodriguez, that, that's more of a, okay, that's... That's pretty out there, yeah. That's pretty blatant, yeah. You know, but it is interesting, yeah, because it is that degrees and stuff. And when I knew Frank, he was he had white hair like me. He was a little elderly man, you know. Like, yeah, it was really fast, you know. So. <laughs>
Well, we tried to get him on this panel, actually. Jorge, Jorge Gutierrez. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not a historian, but um, but I did bring animation history into my class, even with young people. And um, I think, again, it's common sense kinds of things that you want to add to almost any of these as an ingredient. But do your homework also. Um, there are great opportunities. Again, cognitive distance. There are great opportunities to raise the level of um, student understanding on these su subjects and to get them to explore a lot of things. Um, Tom brings up a really good point about the 30s and there was a lot of ethnic humor yeah. and a lot of the, uh, the jabs were, were about white ethnic groups. Okay, back then, the stereotypes and all that. And the students would talk about how you need these broad characterizations and where does stereotype and trying to get people to understand a character, you know, how do we do that? I mean, this is a great food for discussion. And one of the things to do is to really bring up many examples. Don't just limit it to uh, racism and white supremacy and all of this, and because uh, there are quite a few racist things out there, but they're like like you brought up Latino, um, sexist, um, and then a lot of uh, stereotypes about white people. There's a great book that came out about uh, a year ago called White Trash, and the <laughs> uh, the t the title doesn't seem, but it's a great sociological study. The title is kind of sensational, but actually it's a, a great book to read. And what it talks about is how uh, class um, really is the issue. And if you've lived down south and everything else, you know that it's really a class issue, but they use racism right. And that book is, is terrific because it goes back 400 years. 400 years in the United States, how um, they use, and we saw it in this election, okay? So the issue is do your homework, and this could be great food for thought, is basically finding those examples where it lets everybody see. And now you could draw people's empathy. The, the thing of your, and your, the people who came from your family and immigrated here went through all of this stuff and we could see it in animation. Here, look, your ethnic group, you're white. And look at how you were portrayed. And now it's happening to other people. And you have the evidence there. Mm -hmm. So this is a great, a uh, great way to get people to feel empathetic, to understand their own history, to see that we are a nation of immigrants. And your own ancestors probably went through this. And now it's being, uh, people today are being subjected to it from other nationalities and, and other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's one of those things where it's, that's the job of a university is not to proselytize and not to do polemics on this stuff, but to have really deep discussions germane to your subject area, right, um, on these topics that are well thought out, and that's the job of the professor. Yeah. I just want to jump in, too, about the history thing that, um, that yeah, I was always fielding the questions about, you know, was Walt Disney anti-Semitic? You know, that, that's a famous one. And because I know a number of Jewish uh, uh, um, people who worked with Walt Disney, like Joe Grant and Marty Sklar, and, you know, Mark Davis was half Jewish, who would, would roundly defend him and would say, say, absolutely not, that's bullshit. You know, and, and usually what they would say is that the thing is before 19, the 1960s, referring to people in ethnic terms, you know, and, and what we tend to do is we tend to judge people in the 30s and 40s based on modern standards. And it just doesn't work. I mean, bef before 1960s, like where I was growing up and everything, we were the Polacks on the block. And then there was the Germans across the street. The, the Jews ran the, the break shop and the Russians had a delicatessen. And everybody referred to each other in ethnic terms. You know, we didn't think there was anything wrong with that, you know. But but now it's seen as as insensitive. While that was just sort of the, the patois, as it were, of, of the time period. And when you read like the old movie moguls like Jack Warner and those guys, they're constantly calling each other kikes and yids and all. And that was like part of the banter of the time period, you know. Um, I, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying it, you know, again, 
I think Harvey brings up the point too, is that put it in this context and essentially deal with it in an historical context and then move on because we shouldn't, just because it was done back then, doesn't mean it's right for today, okay? Hopefully we're progressing. I, I appreciate all of you um, touching on the idea of keeping the emotions out of it because that, I have a hard time with that. And, uh, and one place where I feel like I have a little freedom is when I teach uh, the McCarthy era. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very hard to say, but if we aren't careful, it's going to go back to that. And that's what's happening right now. And blah, you know. Um, <laughs> It's, it's funny because sometimes I get some reverse stuff too because I was on a, um, I was on a documentary that PBS did about Walt Disney and and um, and um, you know they they were it was WGBH in Boston and they were trying to point out some you know flaws that Disney had as a person you know as well as his good points and I have uh, and I have friends who are like Disney loyalists you know like true and who were like really offended and they go no 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 and it's like Walt Disney was a real guy you know he smoked cigarettes and you know he liked to drink after work and he passed wind at both ends you know he was a normal person <laughs> you know but they're acting like he's a saint you know and and you kind of like well he, he he wasn't either I mean Walt Disney even said once as a quote I'm not Walt Disney. He says, he says, Walt Disney, I smoke, Walt Disney doesn't smoke. I drink, Walt Disney doesn't drink. You know, that was like he created this sort of imaginary person that he would would fit in. You know, I, you know, when they made the movie Saving Mr. Banks and they were talking with Floyd Norman because because Floyd worked with Disney personally. And I said, are you going to mention the cigarettes? <laughs> you know, and it's like, no, you know, but there is one shot where you see Tom Hanks tam tamping out a cigarette. That's like the only allusion to it that, you know, he was a chain smoker. Yeah, it's what yeah. killed him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Could, filterless camels, I think. Yeah. I, I, Lee, I think you really pulled on a little thread here um, on the, on, really, on the, on the legal basis of how to deal with something like that. Uh, and also, I think, just being a good teacher is to get um, someone else in authority to, or an example, to say what you might feel. And the reason that's important, let's say there's someone out there, like there's, there's an interview on PBS or whatever, that exactly portrays what you're feeling inside, bursting with, but, and it's a legitimate point, as long as you have all the points on there, but that point is being raised, then it throws it in the student's lap. And the reason that's important to rather have Tom Seidel, let's say something on a tape that you're showing rather than you say some controversial thing that the students might feel uh, is you, you know, because you have the grade book. And so the, the key here, no, legally too, that's where intimidation comes in, is if they feel they have to agree with the teacher or have to say something because that's the teacher's feelings. So. Again, it comes down to you being a great teacher and developing the curriculum with examples that are not you proselytizing, but are examples from other sources.
This was it's just like it was pretty, you know. Yeah, yeah. You remember that show? You remember that? Yeah. yeah so. The world was very different before the late '60s. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe just pass that mic around. Anybody that wants to comment. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. You were talking about the older uh, cartoons with uh, Cole Black and stuff, and uh, <clears throat> I just remember seeing like. I, I wanted to show them Tex Avery cartoon, you know, and I had a copy of a copy of, you know, because they don't really have that now, I guess. I'm, I don't know, Turner is not, like, releasing them or something. I don't know, you probably know more than me. But uh, so I had a, a Magical Maestro, and there, you know, I thought, oh, this is fun. It's like, you know, a character's up there, and he's, you know, uh, the magician, you know, and all that stuff, and and, like, as I'm going through it, I didn't even think, but it's like, okay, race, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a thing where the, there's a, he, he squirts the in, ink pen and it gets on his face and he turns into a black character and then, you know, there's that and then there's a giant anvil that smashes him and then he has a real deep voice like that, you know, and it's like, and, <laughs> and as, as I was showing it, I, I just, I was like, oh, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> Because I had other students, and they were kind of—they were fine with it. They just were watching the animation. But uh, yeah, you really sometimes those older cartoons, you got to kind of, you know, just disclaimer. You know, you have to do something like that. It's always kind of funny too that uh, you know there's a story about um, the the TV show The Little Rascals, and that that the the um, Fred Quimby who produced the Tom and Jerry sh uh, shorts for MGM, uh, supposedly before he worked on the animation unit, worked a bit with Hal Roach. And uh, uh, the story, uh, you know, I, I, I've heard is that he was one of the people who convinced Hal Roach to integrate the, uh, the the little rascals, to have the black characters. And now, like, you know, we look at Stymie and Buckwheat, you know, they, and saying, well, they're racist. But in the 1930s, the mere action of having children of different races playing together like nothing like the revolution yeah there was no there was no issue they just were having fun and that alone was 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 revolutionary and there were some uh theaters in the south that wouldn't show them it's because it was considered too 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 radical uh, also there was class in those things yeah, oh yeah. remember i mean there was real um class conflict in in a lot of them and so it reflected a um, more naive time about how to address those things. But again, if you're teaching a history class and you wanted to bring up something like that, th there's great food. Again, cognitive dissonance in that is great, uh, fertile soil for having great discussions. You know? Yeah, yeah I, I, when I talk about the, the history of animation, it is in a, a historical context, but I always you know, try and make the students understand that it's not an excuse that, that living in the 30s wasn't an excuse necessarily to be racist or sexist. It may have been a reflection of the times, but it was, you know, the times were ignorant. You know, so I, we can't be like, well, that's okay because it was in the 30s. That's like saying, well, it was okay Great that point. Hitler was anti-Semitic in the 30s. It was the 30s. You know, was, you, you, you can't, we can't excuse the racism. And then I don't, you know, I don't, dwell on that i i do want to circle back to something that that you guys are talking about like way earlier and that is kind of the fear of speaking out as as an instructor and i think a lot of times adjunct instructors feel a lot less secure about voicing opinions or showing certain things or or speaking out about certain things whereas when you're you know, a tenure instructor, you're kind of more secure. There's legal, you know, entanglements they can't, you know, do it. So I think that, you know, we have two kinds of classes in our educational system, and both and adjuncts are not equal in their protections as um, as full time faculty. And I think that that leads to a lot of intimidation from administration or can. You know, and I just wanted to mention that there's not equal, that not all faculty are equal. Well, I'm 10 
tired, so I'm like. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm no, retired, so. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, again, I would go to the AAUP website and really, really, you got to do your homework. If this is your profession and you want to uh, teach what you believe is best for your students, and that might not be seen by the powers that be or the community maybe as the way you should go. That's the whole idea of a university. But yes, you make a great point. Um, there are classes in all of these things and there are legal uh, protections once you get tenure that you don't have if you don't. It's just that simple. And you need to educate yourself. I tell that to everybody. It's like, you know, I had a lawyer uh, all the time. I mean, the email thing. My lawyer said every job I was in, if it's straight up business, someone emails you, just do your business on your email. All other communications are done privately. That's the only place you're protected. Every single thing you put on whatever the workplace you're working in uh, is not protected. They own it. They own every word you put on the, the you are their employee. And a lot of people don't realize that. And that was a great point when someone brought that up because in today's world, um, this is really critical. So you need to know uh, the other thing of having the uh, hour rule when you're working, doing professional stuff and everything, email it, save it, come back an hour later and read it. <laughs> and then edit, and because that uh, pertains to your job and that is owned by your employer. So you want to be very careful about what you put in those emails. Mm. Um, I think we're just going to keep going until the pizza arrives, mm. <laughs> which Kati has gone out to check on, I think. Mm. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up is if you don't know the history of ASIFA, ASIFA is a French acronym, and I'm going to stumble through the French pronunciation. It's something like Association Internationale du Film Animation something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but ASIFA was um, founded in Annecy, France, which is basically a suburb of Geneva, Switzerland, right? Mm -hmm. It's another country, but it's only a half hour away. And, um, and it, it was uh, supported by UNESCO. And help me out, what does UNESCO stand for? Mm -hmm. UNESCO is the United Nations Education Right, scientific mm -hmm. and cultural organization. So basically, ASIFA was started as an organization where they wanted to bring peace to the world through animation. That was their intention. They were going to start this uh, animation festival in Annecy and have animators from all over the world submit their films. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think it would be a more peaceful place if we just all sat around and watched each other's cartoons. Um, so I wanted to bring that up just as a historical point because Animation Educators Forum is a is a part of a CIFA. Okay, so I think we, uh, we're, we're at the lunch period right now. So um, does anybody have any closing statements or anything they want to they want to put in? So that's a good one before we cut off. Yeah. Uh, just uh, another. I, I was going to bring this point up earlier, but uh, with respect to. Uh, one way you can handle students is to bring it back to what the studios do uh, expect in their portfolios. And I think that that's an important thing. There have been, you know, and I, I would use some uh, examples, not using uh, individuals' names from the industry, but there have been people who have drawn phallic symbols in some Disney films, and that's a huge liability for a studio. So if they see or if they sense that you have something that's inappropriate in your portfolio, I think that's an immediate red flag that you probably aren't going to be a, a candidate to be chosen. So um, again, I think going back historically, like you guys have been talking about, I think is always really important. And I think always going back to, you know, expressing to the student, I have your best interests in mind. And th these are really the types of uh, pieces that are going to be well received by studios, I think is a really important point that can, you know, sort of like clarify it for students. And most of them understand it at that point, they do. The other thing too is, you know, well, students are in university, then they don't have much time to produce work. So everything that they produce has value to it. Everything they produce should be content worthy of a portfolio and they don't have time to waste, um, you know, uh, efforts on, on projects that are, that are going to be omitted. So I think that that's a, another good thing for faculty to always try to consider.
Um, I would underline that big time. Uh, I used to call it the who says. And, uh, you know, people would say, well, you're the teacher. What do you think? I said, it doesn't matter what I think. I can't hire you. So we'll bring people in. We'll look at the work. Right? I mean, you know that. That was my, my whole thing. And then I'll learn, too. And so I think it's really critical. Um, we called it, the, uh, the students called it the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we had a rule. We would show um, five things I thought were actually met portfolio standards. So we'd put those out there. Even the professionals a lot of times didn't know we did it this way. So we'd stick those out there. And five things the students thought, because they thought the old guy didn't know what he was talking about. So they would vote to have five things there that I didn't pick that they felt were studio portfolio ready. And then we would randomly, nobody could be in the discussion, even attend that person, like Tom coming to look at work, unless they had their portfolio and their reel. Back then, it was on videotape, and they had their portfolios. And then the professional would just randomly pick people. So I'd say, Tom, pick somebody, you know. And they would look at the work. And what that did, that who says, was it kept everybody honest, and it took it out of my grade book. I actually would do all my grades in pencil. And if I had something as a C, and professionals thought it was portfolio ready, I'd erase the C and give them an A+. Plus. Because that's the only one that counted. Didn't matter. I wasn't a professional. And I didn't know exactly what those studios wanted. And so I was learning too. And if the stu people came up to me, Dave, you picked these five? What the hell? Yeah. We wouldn't hire that. That's how I learned as an instructor. Because I wanted my students to make it. I, I really agree with Bob on this. Um, it's not about my grade book. It was about what the field and this is true in science and every other field. It's what the field accepts. And uh, that's a tough thing. It's the difference between the domain and the field. And it's a deep discussion, but there's a, a real difference between the two. And I, my kids were all working class. I had an after school class with unemployed people, not just high school students. Uh, um, I even had a, a, one of my students lived in a car was homeless and ended up working at Disney. And so to me, it was getting them to the goals they set. And since most of them, all of them were working class, um, they wanted to get in the business and I felt my job was to do that for them. So mine wasn't as an esoteric a class as many university classes, but the who says can be done anywhere. And I think it pro protects you in a lot of ways. Uh, and, it, and it really is better for your students. So I would really, and the only other thing I would say is do your homework. If you, if, if you are gonna traverse these things and not just teach the subject and you wanna get into these subjects, find out what the legal things are before you get yourself in a mess. Well, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more on the, the who says thing and, um, you know, certainly bringing in uh, industry professionals and looking at reels is just, you know, I can't emphasize like how important that is. But um, in the who says area, I also talk to my students about uh, conscious communication with potential employers. So reaching out uh, early on, even as sophomores and juniors, and starting a dialogue with the people who you are going to be in the industry with, whether they are the recruiters or the people that you are uh, admire their work and want to, uh, you know, potentially be a character animator or sculptor um, at one of the studios, is starting a professional dialogue with them early on through LinkedIn or some other. Uh, uh, media outlet and what that uh, communication looks like. So the who says part here is, you know, uh, learning how to speak and write emails that are uh, at a acceptable level, not hey dude, um, but, you know, <laughs> reaching out. And I, you talk a lot about this too in your classes, you know, the professionalism in writing cover letters and reaching out and... Don't use B slash C. Instead of the words. Yeah, and don't write a, a letter that looks like a text, you know. Um, do, you, do you guys review your students' stuff before they send it out? Not all of it. No, no I don't oh, think you I'm can. In the beginning? 
do you actually teach that? Do you go over I teach it in the I class that it, I'm teaching Yeah, right I now. teach it as well and go over that, especially if they're graduating. You know, I, I tell them to reach out and I also advise to never ask for jobs, but to ask for feedback. And that's where they're going to get a lot of um, uh, good information and just growth from that exchange of information about, you know, what they're looking for at their companies, if this is where they want to work, that they need to kind of align with those core values and, um, you know, uh, prepare themselves. So. All right. Uh, we have pizza and we still have a lot of leftover breakfast food. So volunteers feel free to eat some of this food that we have. <laughs> you don't have to wait for the... Okay. for the faculty to go first or anything okay. like that. And, and streaming so, wise, we'll be back on at 1.30, right? Are we yes, going back? We're oh, we're not come going back. back oh, this is it? Okay, we're done? Uh, we're right. not completely done. We're going to come back oh. at 1.30 and do a little um, report of what the AEF has yeah. been doing. Yeah. Uh, but for, I'm just saying for the streaming. So. The streaming yeah. is over, yeah. Okay, we're done with the streaming. So, okay, so, we'll so thank you very much. And thank you, uh, you know, to to uh, you know, uh, was, uh, oh, East Los Kati, Angeles College any, and our hosts and all. Sorry, Cotty, were there any internet questions? Okay, all right, okay. Okay, all right, okay. All right. so thank you very much and uh, we're signing off from East Los Angeles College and till next time, at you. So.